Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Robbie. Thank you to John and to Giora and to the uh, steering committee for having me here again. Uh, it's my second time, um, and it's a little more daunting than the first time, and I'd just like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues here, uh, Professor Claire Harrison and Ruben Messer, who uh, I consider um, to be mentors and uh, dear friends in the field, um, and it's an extreme uh, privilege for me to be sharing this podium with them, um, and thank you very much for your attention in advance. So this talk was meant to be an introductory talk, but a 101-201 talk, which I interpret to mean um, going through some of the basics and trying to go a little bit beyond the basics. And in trying to understand the uh, composition of the audience this morning, my understanding is, and I recognize people here from last year, familiar and friendly faces, that a certain proportion of the audience um, is very experienced and has attended certainly this meeting before. Um, but there's a significant proportion of people that are here perhaps for the first time. So what I'm going to try and do in the next hour or so is to give you the overview of MPNs um, in a relatively abbreviated uh, form compared to the 90-minute lecture that I gave here last year, um, and also to take you through one or two of what I consider to be um, the interesting developments in the field uh, of MPNs. These are things that I've just uh, chosen um, more or less at random. Um, and we can have some discussion about them during, from my point of view, or after the talk, uh, as you would like. So this is uh, the Tel Aviv Medical School, uh, where I work. And the outline for the talk is going to be, um, first we'll go through the basics. We'll talk a bit about normal blood cell formation, hematopoiesis. We'll talk about a spectrum and definition of the myeloid neoplasms. And we can't avoid going through the molecular pathogenesis, um, in some detail, and we'll do that again, especially for people that perhaps are not that familiar with the genes that are involved with this set of diseases. We'll then go through each of the three classical myeloproliferative neoplasms that are so-called Philadelphia negative, in other words, excluding chronic myeloid leukemia, um, and we will talk about their incidence, clinical features, laboratory abnormalities, treatment, and prognosis to try and give a fairly uh, didactic overview of at least these three major MPNs. And what I've decided to try and touch on for the beyond the basic section, which will come at the end of the talk, is the concept um, that is becoming known as an MPN continuum, and I'll try and explain later what I mean by this, and basically that's going to be the incredible overlap that exists on a clinical level between the three MPNs that we'll discuss in detail. An emerging topic that needs to be dealt with by the medical community treating MPN patients is the problem of secondary malignancies or second malignancies in MPN patients, and there's some new data which I'd like to share with you regarding this problem. And finally, um, sort of reincarnation of the whole field of iron metabolism and iron physiology um, in MPN, particularly in polycythemia vera, something that was dealt with by researchers and clinicians many decades ago, uh, and now because of advances in the field of iron metabolism, we can have a renewed look at the importance of iron metabolism and abnormal iron metabolism in polycythemia vera, um, and we can see how this will perhaps lead to new treatments uh, in this field. Just to remind you where we are, we're in the bone marrow. I'm gonna to turn to my right, I think it's easier, so apologies to the people on the side of the room. This is um, a cross-section of a bone. We have the outer section of the bone. We have what's called the trabecular or the spongy bone. And in the middle of all of this, we have the bone marrow, which is where the activity that interests us, the generation of blood cells, occurs. And within that bone marrow space, we have the originator cell, so-called stem cell, which is a multipotent stem cell. This is a cell that is going to give rise to all the different blood cells that we have circulating um, in our body including those that develop in the bone marrow. We still don't exactly know how to typify um, this stem cell. There probably is some kind of a receptor that could be specific to a stem cell, but this is yet to be identified. These uncommitted or multipotent stem cells, when they divide, have a unique property. They divide into two cells. One cell will be identical to the parent cell, so we'll have another stem cell to maintain the stem cell pool. But the second progeny that is um, developed from this first mitosis or this first cell division will be a slightly more committed cell. It will be different from the originator cell. And this cell has already been destined to become one of the mature blood cells that we have in our body. 
And this process continues, and we have now certain receptors that are present on the surface of the more committed cells in the bone marrow. Again, all of this is taking place in the bone marrow. Here, for example, we have the receptor for the granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which is going to destine this particular cell over here to become a neutrophil in the peripheral blood, one of the white blood cells. This cell will have a similar receptor, but it's different, and this will develop into a monocyte or a mononuclear cell in the peripheral blood. Here we have the MPL receptor, which is beginning to sound familiar from the MPN uh, world, and this will become a megakarrier site and ultimately platelets in the peripheral blood. Here we have the erythropoietin receptor, very important in MPNs, and these cells will develop into red blood cells that will be present in the peripheral blood. So these dark blue cells over here in the megakarrier site, the top part of, this, of the slide, this is all going on in the bone marrow. These mature cells are what are released into the peripheral blood circulation. So the myeloproliferative neoplasms um, form part of the myeloid diseases, and we're going to be talking about the so-called Philadelphia negative to imply not including chronic myeloid leukemia, classic myeloproliferative neoplasms. Classic comes to exclude the non-classic myeloproliferative neoplasms such as eosinophilic disorders and mast cell disorders. So this is quite a long, cumbersome term, but it's still used fairly widely to represent these three diseases, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytosis, or thrombocythemia, as it is sometimes called, and primary myelofibrosis. This slide is pinched, and it's been shown at hundreds of uh, medical conferences, but it's brilliant, and it shows us the classic myeloproliferative neoplasms, the ET, the PV, and the MF. In the broader context of myeloid neoplasms, here's the CML, the Philadelphia positive disease, and here is acute myeloid leukemia, which may be a result uh, of a primary disease or may develop out of one of these chronic myeloproliferative neoplasms. In this slide, we see for the first time but it's something that is familiar to everybody in this room, I'm fairly sure, and that is the um, ubiquitous jak 2 V617F mutation that is present in almost all patients with polycythemia vera and approximately 50 to 60 percent of patients with ET or myelofibrosis. And going to that JAK2 mutation, this is pretty much how it works, just to have a quick first glimpse. Here we have normal physiology. We have this receptor structure over here. It's composed of two arms. We have the erythropoietin molecule given in this example, but other um, ligands or other chemicals, hormones, could be responsible for bridging these two separate arms. Once that occurs, we have activation of what is called signal transduction, which basically means moving a message, a chemical message, from outside of the cell. In this case, it would be the erythropoietin molecule that links to its receptor over here, transmits a message, which technically occurs by the addition of phosphorylation or phosphorylation of enzymes within the cell. And here we have the JAK2 molecule, which is well known to us. And this message is then transmitted through the liquid part of the cell, the cytoplasm, right the way down to the nucleus, which would be down over here. And the ultimate effect of that is going to be either proliferation of cells, differentiation of cells, longevity of cells. Apoptosis is the natural death of cells, the so-called suicide me mechanism that exists in cells. And here we have something which inhibits that suicide mechanism, so we have prolonged uh, life of particular cells. We have other effects as well, and we can see over here that this occurs via a number of intermediaries. So we start off with the JAK2 up here, and we have MAP kinase, PI3 kinase, and STAT5. These abbreviations all mean something. Um, in our context this morning of MPN, we're focusing on JAK2. If there's JAK2, you can infer that there's probably a JAK1, which there is. There's also a JAK3. Um, but JAK2 via particularly STAT5, and if there's STAT5, that means that there's STATs before 5 as well. Over here we have the, a very important pathway link, linking erythropoietin to the formation of red blood cells. And we introduce over here a new molecule, new to us and perhaps new to you as well, called ERFI or erythroferone, which is an important molecule. We'll come back to that later in the iron section. And that has importance because it links directly to iron metabolism again with the introduction here of yet another molecule called hepcidin, which is, again, a relatively newly discovered molecule 
Um, and this has got very important consequences for iron metabolism, iron physiology, and since iron is such an important uh, element in the production of hemoglobin, uh, which is what our red blood cells are constituted of, this obviously has importance in the red blood cell production in diseases like polycythemia vera. So this is normal physiology. Abnormal physiology or pathology appears on the right part of the slide, and we can see over here that absent of the erythropoietin molecule, we have this activation of this entire pathway, the phosphorylation signals over here indicated by the letter P, is what stimulates the signal transduction via these intermediaries that appear lower down in the, in, the, in, the, in the cartoon over here. And you can see by the intensity of the arrows that this in fact occurs at, to a greater extent and with greater intensity than the physiological stimulus which is erythropoietin. So this cartoon actually represents for us normal and abnormal signal transduction using erythropoietin as an example, and how this mutation in the JAK2 gene activates the system without the normal ligand receptor binding event that is what causes this to happen normally. So this is the mutation, and it sort of bypasses the normal physiology which is meant to occur up here. We get the resultant unregulated production of signal in the cytoplasm of the cell, in the liquid part of the cell, that really leads to the proliferation, the differentiation of cells, the inability for these cells to die, and turns out as well affects iron metabolism in a recently discovered mechanism. However, unlike CML, where the single mutation um, in the, the BCR able translocation causes CML and is sufficient in animals, for example, to cause the disease, the JAK2 mutation that we've spoken about until now is not the disease-causing mutation. It is a mutation that occurs sometime after an initial event, and this initial event has yet to be discovered, and this slide is more than 10 years old, as you can see by some of the references over here, and yet we still do not have this initial event that causes the MPNs, any one of them. We do know that the JAK2 mutation occurs somewhere along a pathway over here, which is demonstrated by this dotted line, and then something very important happens. There is a mix in here of other mutations that may occur. There is the element of the intensity or the amount of JAK2 mutant genes present in a particular cell, i.e. is there a heterozygous or a homozygous status. We have two genes for JAK2 in each cell. Are both mutant? Is one mutant? What is the size of the colony of cells that develops that has either one mutation or two mutations in it? So this is known as the allele dose, the amount of JAK2 mutation that is present in a particular patient's bone marrow. The other mutations that we're familiar with and that we'll mention later on in the morning. The interactions with the patient's germline genetic makeup, in other words, what are the potential mutations that are present outside of the bone marrow in the sperm and egg cells where there are JAK2 genes present as well? They're not active, but certain mutations or polymorphisms, changes in the genes in those cells may influence what happens in the bone marrow as well. And potentially other things as well will determine which of these three diseases the patient has. I think you're familiar with the conundrum that we have one identical JAK2 mutation present in patients with ET, PV, or MF. The patients often look very different, although I will show you later how sometimes they can end up looking quite similar uh, to one another. But nevertheless, at certain points in their clinical history, patients with ET do not resemble patients with polycythemia vera clinically, laboratory-wise, yet they have the identical mutation. How can that be? Why doesn't the mutation cause the same disease in everybody? The answer lies potentially somewhere over here. Is it a quantity of mutation that's important? Other mutations that are present in the patient's uh, cell genome and the patient's germline, in other words, their hereditary genetic components that influence the outcome of that JAK2 mutation and cause the clinical picture to be one of either ET, PV, or MF. To summarize, the JAK2 mutation obviously is going to be very important in these diseases. It's present um, in its V617F form in 95% of patients with PV, 50 to 60% of patients with ET and myelofibrosis. There is another mutation at another exon, the exon 12, which is present in another 3 or so percent of patients with polycythemia vera. 
and we'll introduce here the MAPL mutation. We mentioned that before in the terms of normal physiology. That's present in about 5% uh, or so of ET and MF patients. And this is slide summarizes the JAK2 data with a little bit of the MAPL data over here, which leaves us with approximately one-third of patients with ET and MF who do not have the JAK2 or the MAPL mutation. This is just a cartoon again of the MAPL mutation of the MAPL gene showing how it, oops, excuse me, how it interacts with its receptor over here, which is uh, the, the receptor for thrombopoietin, which is going to be the equivalent of the erythropoietin. However, this is going to in, induce signal transduction to result in the formation of platelets. And this was the position until a number of years ago when the second very important gene mutation in MPN was discovered, and that is the calreticulin gene mutation. The calreticulin gene mutation actually increases JAK stat signaling as well, so it has the same effect as the JAK mutation. It causes proliferation uh, of cells in the bone marrow. The mutation itself is found in the stem cells, um, and again, this makes redundant the normal physiology of that hormone, erythropoietin, thrombopoietin, um, binding to its receptor, and the ultimate result over here is, as you can see, increase of this jack stat pathway signaling, which as we saw before, really leads to proliferation, differentiation, lack of cell death, and the overpopulation of the bone marrow by uh, cells. So once that was discovered, we have a slightly fuller picture, and we can see over here that if we look at these three diseases again, PV, we have almost 100% of patients with a JAK2 mutation, either the classic exon 14 mutation or the rarer exon 12 mutation. If we look at ET, we see over here approximately 50 to 60% of patients with a JAK2 mutation, about another third with a calreticulin mutation, another 5% with a MAPL mutation, still a segment over here without any mutation at all. And the picture with myelofibrosis is very similar to that in essential thrombocytosis, the summary uh, being over here. This important group of approximately 10% of patients who are so-called triple negative, they do not have one of the three driver mutations, either JAK2, calreticulin, or MAPL, together known as the driver mutations because they drive the disease. They seem to occur relatively early on in the genesis of the disease in the bone marrow. Again, another conundrum, why do these patients have the same type of MPN as the patients who do have these gene mutations? Well, it could be that they have the mutation, but just we aren't smart enough or sensitive enough to pick it up. The clone is too small. We don't have the right techniques yet. There could be other mutations. Who says that three is the magic number? There might be more, and they may have uh, one of the other mutations. Um, and we do need to acknowledge that sometimes these patients are misdiagnosed, and in fact, they don't have an MPN at all, but they have one of the other cause causes, say, for example, of an increased platelet count, so-called reactive thrombocytosis. Heading into uh, the individual diseases, let's just have a look at the production of red blood cells and look a little bit about the, at, at the physiology of red blood cell production and the role of erythropoietin. You're probably aware, I think, that erythropoietin head comes from the kidney and affects the bone marrow. So we need kidneys to make our red blood cells. And the major stimulus for erythropoietin production is low oxygen tension or low pressure of oxygen in the circulation. Cells in the uh, juxtatubular area of the kidney sense this decreased oxygen tension. And via a number of intermediary steps, they release, they cause the release of erythropoietin, increase the gene expression of erythropoietin many, many fold, as you can see over here. The erythropoietin circulates in the blood, the bloodstream. It's led to the bone marrow, and there it meets up with the early cells in the bone marrow that have the erythropoietin receptor, the so-called erythroblasts, um, where it acts in the cartoon that we saw before by binding to its receptor, initiating the JAK-STAT pathway within the cell and leading to cell proliferation and impe impeding apoptosis, increasing the number of cells overall. And here we see that interaction in the bone marrow. The resultant red blood cell formation. This slide is part of the 201 session, not 101 session. And it's complicated. And I'll take you through it. When I say it's complicated, I mean it's complicated for me. So let's go back to the bone marrow. We have erythropoiesis taking place in the bone marrow over here. And that results in red blood cells being formed. Now, at the same time, those early red blood cell precursors, the so-called erythroblasts in the bone marrow, 
secrete a soluble chemical, a cytokine, called ERFE, E-R-F-E, which is known as erythroferone. Erythroferone, and possibly other signals as well, affects the liver. And it affects the liver in the sense that it blocks the synthesis of this important protein called hepcidin. The liver in Latin is the hepar, and so hepcidin is actually a toxic molecule. It was first discovered in, in microorganisms and has an important role in microorganisms. Um, but this hepcidin, the hep it means liver, when it is secreted, it blocks the absorption of iron from the gut, and it blocks the release of iron from iron storage cells in the body, particularly from macrophages, which are found in the liver and the spleen. So hepcidin traps iron. It either traps it in the gut cells or it traps it in storage cells, but one way or another, there is a decrease in circulating iron in the bloodstream, and that iron is very important for the production of red blood cells. So if we impede the production of hepcidin, we're actually going to be releasing iron to the circulation. So erythroferone, or ERFI, increases the amount of iron that's available for the body to use. The majority of iron that we use in our body is used in the production of red blood cells, but we'll talk a little later about other organs that are also reliant on iron, particularly the brain, the muscular system, and this is important for our overall well-being. So, erythropoiesis releases ERFI, ERFI blocks hepcidin, blocking hepcidin increases the amount of iron that we have circulating in the blood, which will then allow us to continue the process of erythropoiesis. There are other pathways that are involved over here as well in modulating hepcidin. We're not going to talk about the BMP SMAD, but we will say a word about interleukin-6, which is a cytokine or a chemical that is released when there are conditions of inflammation present in the body, either acute inflammation or chronic inflammation. And this is extreme relevance to MPN, perhaps particularly to myelofibrosis, because levels of interleukin-6 in myelofibrosis, but in polycythemia vera as well, are increased. Now, interleukin-6 stimulates the production of hepcidin. That's the positive, that's the negative. So we actually have here a conflict between erythroferone and interleukin-6 vis-a-vis their effect on hepcidin. And I'll already tell you what's at the end of the lecture. This is important in polycythemia vera because in polycythemia vera we have increased erythroferone and increased interleukin-6. So there's kind of a little mini Star Wars over here between these two molecules in terms of what is the effect going to be on hepcidin and ultimately what is the effect going to be on available iron for erythropoiesis and for the other organs in the body like the brain and the neuromuscular system which depend on iron. This is relatively new information. We're trying to understand how this works really in normal physiology, in patients with anemias, and in patients with polycythemia vera. But it's certainly exciting, and we'll see how this may impact on drug development as well. Just to zoom in a little, so we have erythropoietin. You know where it comes from now. It acts on the bone marrow. It binds to its receptor. It stimulates erythropoiesis via the JAK2 STAT5 pathway. As part of that process of increased erythropoietic activity, we have the secretion of this protein called erythroferone. Erythroferone suppresses hepcidin in the liver, and that results in increased iron availability for erythropoiesis once more. So just to have a look at the receptor, just to go through this very quickly, the erythropoietin receptor is linked to the JAK2 molecule, and under normal circumstances, no signal is passed beyond that. But when erythropoietin, the hormone, binds, the conformation of the receptor changes, the JAK2 molecule becomes phosphorylated, and there's cross-linking of the receptor, and we have the signal transduction resulting in red blood cell formation, normal. Abnormal, polycythemia vera, we have autonomously phosphorylated JAK2, and we have autonomous production of these signal transduction molecules, the STAT5 being very important, and we have multiple copies of our red blood cells performed. 
We'll now briefly look at the three specific diseases in a more didactic way. So let's have a look at the epidemiology and the incidence of polycythemia vera. It's present uh, worldwide. It seems to be of lower incidence in Japan. The average age uh, of patients with polycythemia vera is 60. However, significant proportion of patients are much younger, less than 50 and less than 40 years of age. Uh, men are overrepresented uh, compared to women. And interestingly, this probably has something to do with the male sex having a higher allele burden of JAK2. As we mentioned before, that's one of the things that can influence the clinical phenotype that we get with JAK2 mutations being the same. So men seem to have more uh, a higher allele burden than women when it comes to JAK2. Approximately two per 100,000 individuals, but a lot of people think this is an underestimation. The disease is probably underdiagnosed, but that's the official number that's given. There is a familial tendency. We mentioned the germline uh, influence on JAK2. Um, there are, there's certainly uh, quite a prominent uh, familial component to MPNs in general and to polycythemia vera. And in the vast majority of patients, the specific cause of this disease is unknown. So this is meant to be beyond the NCCN guidelines, and Ruben is in the room. He's responsible for these guidelines, um, and here they are. I think everybody knows um, that the WHO changed the diagnostic criteria for P. vera a couple of years ago, and this made a very big change in practice, and this is how they're uh, displayed in the um, latest edition of the NCCN guidelines. And I think that we need to uh, be cognizant over here of the criteria, so we'll spend a minute going through them. We need either all three of the major criteria or the first two of the major criteria and the minor criterion. What are the major criteria? Well, we have to have increased red blood cells, and that can be determined in a number of ways, either looking at the hemoglobin or the hematocrit or looking at the red cell mass, which requires um, special tests involving radio-labeled isotopes, which, which is fairly um, infrequent uh, these days, although it was once a very commonly performed test. So we'll focus on the hemoglobin and the hematocrit, and these are the new numbers that we need to remember. 16.5 grams for men and 16 for women, or a hematocrit of 49 in men and 48 in women. So that's the first criterion. The second criterion is a bone marrow biopsy showing the characteristic features of polycythemia vera, as opposed to a bone marrow that would show features of secondary polycythemia or a bone marrow that would so show features of one of the other MPNs that we'll uh, deal with in a moment. And the third major criterion is, in fact, a JAK2 mutation in one of its two forms. The minor criterion is a reduced erythropoietin level. If you remember the feedback um, physiology that I, I uh, alluded to, when we have a lot of red cells produced normally, we will decrease the amount of erythropoietin that the kidney makes, and so the serum concentration of erythropoietin will be low. So in secondary polycythemia, we do not expect that to happen. In primary or, or primary polycythemia vera, since there is autonomous signaling within the red blood cells because of the mutated JAK, erythropoietin becomes redundant. The kidney, therefore, does not produce erythropoietin, and when we try and measure it in the serum or in the plasma, in the blood, the level is extremely low. The clinical features, probably familiar to a lot of people over here, headaches, visual disturbances, um, so-called microvascular abnormalities, and they can really be, uh, there are a host of these uh, symptoms that patients have that relates to the head area, either visual disturbances, uh, auditory disturbances, uh, my head is full, doc, I feel like I have cotton wool in my, hair, in my head, I can't think clearly, uh, fatigue, um, really a, a number of different flavors of these, of these uh, symptoms. Generalized fatigue, itch, which is known as prur pruritus or pruritus. Weight loss may be a feature of polycythemia vera. We mentioned that interleukin-6 and we mentioned that chronic inflammation. We associate that typically with myelofibrosis, but it is very important in polycythemia vera as well. Plethora, which is a word I think you liked last year, which means ruddiness, redness, actually means a lot, right? Plethora, so a lot of red cells. Um, and clinically, uh, we see that as physicians. And we also can pick up an enlarged spleen, which is present in an important proportion of patients. So this is what some of the patients may look like. When we look at the laboratory, we've mentioned these things in terms of the criteria. We have an increased hemoglobin um, and hematocrit. The red cell mass, if we were to measure it, which we don't routinely, uh, would be elevated. A lot of these patients will have leukocytosis. Uh, that means a high white count or a high platelet count thrombocytosis. Remember, the gene abnormality is in a stem cell. Uh, 
Um, and again, one of the mysteries of myeloproliferative neoplasms, how a gene that's meant to produce red cells will also produce leukocytes and thrombocytes variably. Not all patients have uh, an increase in those two cell lines. Some will have an increase in all three cell lines. Some will have an increase in two cell lines. They'll always have an increase in the hemoglobin. That's the definition of the disease. Serum erythropoietin is low, and the JAK2 mutation is present, and we test that in the blood. We need to do bone marrow biopsy to make the disease now by WHO standards. And what we see there is an increase in all of the three cell lines, so-called tri-lineage hyperplasia. That means there's increased of the granulocyte or the white cell lineage present in the, in the marrow. There's increased number of megakaryocytes that appear normal. And there's an increased number of those erythroblasts and normoblasts, which are the, the uh, pre progenitors of the red cells. There are also certain chromosomal abnormalities that we can pick up in the bone marrow. Uh, which we look for routinely. Practically, how do we go about making the diagnosis? Well, it's very easy because the screening is done on peripheral blood, so it's a blood test that's done in the doctor's office or in the HMO or wherever it's done, but it's very, very simple technically. It's just uh, drawing blood, and usually we'll do a screen that involves looking for the JAK2 mutation that is found by the uh, now ubiquitous technique of polymerase chain reaction, PCR, which again is a tabletop um, machine the size smaller than your your printer at home that can do this analysis. And we look for levels of erythropoietin. And we have four options over here. If we start off on the left of the slide, we'll find the mutation and erythropoietin will be low. If we look at the WHO uh, rules for making the diagnosis, this is almost certainly going to be polycythemia vera, vera. We need to do the bone marrow biopsy to prove that if we want to fulfill the criteria. I think more and more people are doing bone marrow biopsies to diagnose polycythemia vera these days, although a few years ago this would have been considered sufficient, again, in the context of a high hemoglobin, high hematocrit, to make the diagnosis. Over on the right, we have the opposite. There's no mutation. Erythropoietin is normal. This is probably not going to be polycythemia vera. Think about one of the other causes of polycythemia, the so-called secondary or relative polycythemias. In the middle, we have the more complicated patients. That is where one of the tests is normal, but the other is abnormal, apart from repeating the tests to make sure that the results are accurate. These are patients today that we will almost certainly do a bone marrow biopsy in to try and look for the characteristic features uh, with our pathologist to make the diagnosis. The treatment in very broad strokes, is to control the hematocrit and to give aspirin. There are a number of ways of controlling the hematocrit. This is done in a, um, in, a, in a way that is dependent on the patient's risk for thrombosis, for blood clot formation. So we either do phlebotomies in younger patients or give a drug, hydroxyurea, in older patients. Interferon, which we'll be speaking about this afternoon, is a drug that's very useful in decreasing the hematocrit that's used in special circumstances and right now in a number of research studies around the world. And ruxolitinib is used in polycythemia vera that is resistant to treatment or in patients that are unable to tolerate one of the drugs that they've been given, usually hydroxyurea. The antiplatelet drug is aspirin, and this is based on very high-level uh, research results from clinical trials that have been done uh, a number of years ago. Polycythemia vera evolves. So in the early stages, um, we might not even have an increase in hematocrit or hemoglobin. This is the so-called early polycythemia vera, which used to be known as masked polycythemia vera. An example might be in someone that has ongoing bleeding, that are sort of doing an autophlebotomy against their will, if you like. Sometimes this is relevant in women uh, who still have periods, although this would be a younger age group, or men and women who are losing blood from another disease altogether, like a colon cancer or colonic polyps, uh, or have iron deficiency for another reason. Um, turns out that we might also be catching people very early that have a low allele burden of JAK2. So they don't have so much of the JAK2 stimulus to make uh, erythrocytes, yet they still do have polycythemia vera. With time, they will develop splenomegaly in a certain number of patients. Fibrosis will develop, and this takes decades to occur until we reach the last stage of this uh, disease where we can get one of two types of transformation. The more common transformation is to post-polycythemia vera, post vera myelofibrosis, uh, when these patients start to look like patients with myelofibrosis. The spleen enlarges, um, abnormal cells start to appear in the peripheral blood, and the hemoglobin, after being high for many years, is now low without needing phlebotomies or with reducing the dose of hydroxyurea. Those, again, are the criteria of the WHO for determining post-polycythemic myelofibrosis.
A slightly more uh, acute form of transformation would be that to acute myeloid leukemia. If you remember one of the early slides, we said that the uh, myeloid diseases can end up as acute myeloid leukemia and polycythemia vera in approximately 10 to 15 percent of cases will transform to acute myeloid leukemia. So looking at the disease course, we've spoken about the leukemic transformation, the polycythemia myelofibrosis, post-polycythemia myelofibrosis. But the things that really concern us when we're treating polycythemia vera on an ongoing basis that are amenable to change that can be modified are the risk of thrombosis and the risk of bleeding, most particularly the risk of thrombosis. That is the most important clinical issue that we need to deal with apart from patients' well-being and symptom management. And we'll come back to that later. Essential thrombocytosis, again, looking at it in a, in a didactic way, this occurs in all populations, slightly younger age at a diagnosis. Here, women are overrepresented compared to men, again, possibly to do with the JAK2 and the JAK2 allele burden. And again, the incidence here is somewhere between two to three to perhaps five per 100,000 per population. Back to the NCCN and back to the WHO criteria from 2016, a little more complex over here, requires a platelet count of above 450. It requires a bone marrow biopsy that is not compatible with another disease. And uh, we need to rule out other diseases um, with the various testing that appears over here. We have to be careful because sometimes these patients may have a myelodysplastic syndrome with thrombocytosis, so the differential diagnosis or the number of diagnostic possibilities in a patient with thrombocytosis is perhaps more than in a patient with an elevated hemoglobin. We want to find one of our driver mutations over here, one of these clonal markers, and a minor criterion over here would be the presence of yet another clonal marker, not one of the driver mutations, but one of the passenger mutations. There are more mutations that we know represent a clonal or a neoplastic disorder. And if you find one of those, you meet uh, the, the minor criterion for the WHO. We need all of the four major criteria, again, or three major plus one minor, to be able to confidently make a diagnosis um, of ET. So this is a peripheral blood smear. This is a normal picture on the left, these are red blood cells in the background, these are white cells, and here we have a couple of platelets scattered. That's pretty much a normal picture of what platelets would look like on a peripheral blood smear. And here we can see tons and tons and tons of platelets uh, on the right in a patient with essential thrombocytemia. The bone marrow shows a similar picture of an increased number of megakaryocytes. You can't miss these cells. They're giant, they're huge, and they're all over. And here is a, a close-up view of one of them with this so-called multi-lobated nucleus, uh, which is typical of essential thrombocytosis. These patients, firstly, may be asymptomatic, as they often are. If they are symptomatic, again, they may have microcirculatory abnormalities because of this very high platelet concentration in the, in the plasma, in the blood. Uh, blood circulation can be affected, and typically the microcirculation is affected. And when this occurs in the peripheries, there's a specific symptom called erythromyalgia, which means very painful red extremities. This responds incredibly well to uh, even a single dose of aspirin sometimes. Headache, abnormal sensations, that's paresthesia, visual hearing uh, abnormalities, minor strokes, major strokes. These are all things that can occur. In terms of the major vessel thrombosis, major stroke, cardiovascular abnormalities such as myocardial infarction, deep vein thrombosis, um, and pulmonary embolus, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. Paradoxically, when the platelet count gets very, very high, more than one and a half million per microliter, we have the uh, opposite effect, and that is bleeding rather than clotting. And this has got to do with clotting factors that are adsorbed onto the surface of the platelets, and so the clotting abnormality develops, uh, rather a bleeding abnormality develops, and pa patients can present with bleeding rather than with clotting. And this is just what it looks like. This is a peripheral vein in one of our patients with a blood clot formed in it. This is a deep vein thrombosis in the left leg. The entire leg is swollen and has a reddish hue compared to the right leg. This is a picture of somebody with erythromyalgia. So you can see over here the um, very dark purplish appearance of the tips of the toes, um, the platelet patient who had over 2 million platelets. These are some of the bleeding symptoms that we might find uh, on the inner lower lip, on the palms of the hand, um, and on a skin surface over there. What do we find in the laboratory? Again, we have the platelet count is elevated. That's by definition. These patients may also have a high white count, similar to the patients with polycythemia vera. The hemoglobin, by definition, will be normal. Otherwise, we'd be talking about polycythemia vera. There are certain chemical abnormalities that are present in very commonly performed blood tests. The LDH, which is a lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. It's produced by cells 
uh, replicating in the bone marrow, uric acid, uh, which is produced by, by uh, rapid cell turnover, can be elevated. And again, we have these mutations that you know are detected in peripheral blood by simple PCR testing. When it comes to the treatment, again, our main aim over here is to prevent clotting. To an extent, bleeding, but predominantly clotting. And this is done by assessing the patient's risk for clotting um, and then proceeding accordingly. So the risk for clotting is determined by a patient's previous history of clotting, the patient's background medical conditions, and whether or not the patient uh, has the JAK2 mutation and the patient's age. So we can divide patients basically into low risk or high risk for clotting. Low risk patients, by definition, will be patients who are less than 60 years old and who do not have a history of having a blood clot. If you are over 60 years old or have a history of a blood clot, by definition, you are in the high risk group. And then you will be treated similar to polycythemia vera by decreasing the platelet count using one of a number of drugs and receiving aspirin. That's fairly simple to comprehend. The low risk group has actually become a little more complicated. And over here, we have to look at the fact that the JAK2 mutation is not only a mutation that involves proliferation of cells, as we've mentioned many times this morning, but it also increases the coagulability of the blood and is associated directly with blood clot formation. So the minute any patient has a JAK2 mutation, they'll receive aspirin. If they do not have a JAK2 mutation, let's say they have a calreticular mutation, but they do have cardiovascular risk factors, so they smoke, have hypertension, obesity, diabetes, they'll get aspirin as well. The very healthy, young people, no cardiovascular risk factors, no JAK2 mutation, will not receive any treatment at all. So the course of this disease, thrombosis occurs in up to 30% of people, more arterial than venous, bleeding occurs in a smaller proportion, a lower transformation rate to myelofibrosis and to acute leukemia, and overall these patients have an absolutely wonderful outcome with the uh, overall survival that is the same as that of the general population. The third, myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis, again, this is a disease of the bone marrow that is clonal. That means that it's neoplastic. The fibrosis re leads to bone marrow failure. So these patients typically will have, at some point in their disease, pancytopenia. That means low blood counts all across, low white cells, anemia, and a low platelet count. The symptoms may be generalized or may be specific and related to the spleen. They have splenomegaly, and they may have this unusual situation where they form red blood cells granular sites and platelets, in other words, bone marrow formation outside of the bone marrow, so-called extramedullary hematopoiesis. The peripheral blood smear is often abnormal with abnormal forms of red blood cells that you can see over here. And abnormal precursor cells, these are normoblasts that should only be present in the bone marrow that make their way into the peripheral blood because of the abnormal architecture of the bone marrow. These are just bone marrow pictures to show you the abnormalities. Again, this is present in all populations. The average age of diagnosis here is older than ET or PV, about 65 years old. In general, the etiology is unknown. We do not know what causes this disease. And again, the incidence is somewhere between one and five per 100,000 individuals. Very complicated sets of criteria for the WHO. We're not gonna go through all of them. Just to mention that there's a newly created subset of myelofibrosis called pre-primary myelofibrosis. Uh, and that means that you can have patients who have um, criteria for myelofibrosis, but they don't actually have fibrosis yet in their bone marrow. And these are early diagnosed patients with myelofibrosis. The clinical features um, really um, are dependent on a lot of these abnormal proteins, these cytokines that we mentioned earlier, interleukin-6 appears up there, and these cause a chronic inflammatory state which leads to weight loss, leads to fever, leads to night sweats. The body is generating energy um, for, for nothing, and uh, that causes weight loss in these symptoms, etc. cetera. Um, the bone marrow symptoms will be those of anemia in particular, and the uh, spleen, when it enlarges, will cause local complications, either pain, something called early satiety, which means that when you start eating, you feel full immediately because the spleen uh, anatomically is located uh, right next to the stomach, and when the spleen enlarges, it compresses the stomach, so the stomach can't expand uh, during eating, and the brain senses that we're full after taking two spoons of the meal. 
picture of a patient of mine with extramedullary hematopoiesis, these tumors appearing in various places uh, uh, on the body, um, one of the rarer complications associated with myelofibrosis. Laboratory abnormalities, so the blood count abnormalities may be variable. Ultimately, these patients will all develop uh, pancytopenia. The LDH and uric acid as metabolic abnormalities are present here as well. There are a number of chromosomal abnormalities that may be present in the bone marrow and the mutations that we've spoken about, both the driver mutations uh, and so-called passenger mutations, which are more advanced the mutations, can be present. And here is the breakdown that we've seen before as well. The diagnosis is made by looking at the peripheral blood smear, the splenomegaly. Very often we cannot aspirate from the bone marrow because the fibrosis in the bone marrow doesn't allow us to um, aspirate liquid material from the bone marrow. That's known as a dry tap. But on the biopsy sample that we take, we will see extensive fibrosis, which is essentially scar tissue formation. Uh, we have to exclude other causes. And if we can find the molecular abnormality, which we do in over 75% of patients, one of the JAK2, calreticulin, and so forth, that will define this as a primary myelofibrosis, i.e. a clonal neoplastic myeloproliferative disease. Again, we look at the scoring systems that we have for these patients to adapt our treatment based on their risk um, of progression, the risk of dying. There are a number of these scoring systems that have been developed, and they continue to be developed, looking at uh, both clinical markers and these days molecular and genetic uh, chromosomal abnormalities as well, give us more and more information about how patients uh, may fare in the future. When we diagnose a patient up here at the beginning of the course of treatment, this represents 100% of patients being alive. After a number of years, some of the patients will remain alive, and unfortunately, not all. So it would be very useful for our patients and for us to know how to treat our patients if we knew on day one what a patient's prognosis was. Are they going to live out here for 30 years, or are they only going to live for three or four years? Clearly, our treatment plan would be very different for those two groups of patients. And looking at a variety of these um, scoring systems, we are able to predict fairly well what the outcome of patients will be. And as I said, it's getting more and more sophisticated using some of these uh, uh, genes that we've spoken about today, we can see over here that the so-called triple negative, the patients that do not have any of these three driver mutations, they actually have a worse prognosis. And today we add into that using techniques such as next generation sequencing, which is a very sensitive technique to find small clones of cells with the so-called passenger mutations, mutations in genes such as AXL, ASXL1 and so forth, um, to provide some prognostic information that people are starting to use to base clinical decisions upon. So again, looking at the risk-adapted uh, treatment program, we have over here the patients at lowest risk that will live for up to 30 years, may not need any treatment at all. Uh, and we have patients uh, who are at intermediate or high risk who would go straight to a bone marrow transplant if one was available for them, a stem cell transplant, or they would have symptomatic therapy. And of course, we're always interested in trying to get patients onto clinical trials wherever possible to um, provide investigational drugs that have potential to change uh, the disease pattern or at least modify uh, and improve patients' quality of life. So just to look at the uh, symptomatic treatment for, for PMF, which is really what we uh, are involved in in most patients, we have to treat the constitutional symptoms, the fevers, the weight loss. We do that using ruxolitinib, which has really changed the way that we treat patients with uh, myelofibrosis. Corticosteroids, prednisone, dexamethasone, drugs of that nature are used. Anemia, there are a variety of drugs that are used to, to, court, to treat anemia, and some new drugs as well that are based on uh, iron physiology that we discussed earlier. And then drugs that are used to treat the splenomegaly-related symptoms. Again, ruxolitinib over here has been uh, a game changer in that sense, and there are other options available too. So just to move in the last few minutes to some of the newer issues uh, that are arising in MPN, the so-called MPN continuum. This is a very, very simple uh, diagram from a number of years ago, um, which I think just shows how complicated it can be as a clinician when you're faced with a patient to actually try and decide what kind of MPN they may have. So this is erythrocytosis, thrombocytosis, splenomegaly, fibrosis. These are our three diseases. All patients with polycythemia vera will have erythrocytosis. None of the ET or myelofibrosis patients will have erythrocytosis. So that's actually easy. You can put the patient in the PV category quite quickly. However, patients with thrombocytosis are represented in all three of these diseases. Again, by definition, all patients with ET must have thrombocytosis. Splenomegaly, 
Well, a lot of patients with primary myelofibrosis will have splenomegaly, but that doesn't help you make the diagnosis because a very important proportion of patients with ET and PV will also have splenomegaly, and the same goes with fibrosis. Patients in their bone marrow with PV or ET can have, uh, thrombo can have fibrosis. So it can be quite tricky to tease out uh, exactly what we're dealing with, and there is a certain degree of overlap clinically among these patients. And here, I've just shown it as a, as a Venn diagram. We have the primary myelofibrosis. We now have these prefibrotic patients that actually have myelofibrosis, but in the very early stages. We have patients with PV and ET that can develop myelofibrosis. They can all end up developing acute myeloid leukemia. And we often have patients that we see with essential thrombocytosis, and we say they have essential thrombocytosis. They seem to fit the criteria. We follow them, and ultimately, they develop an increase in their hematocrit. Why is that happening? Do we now change the diagnosis to polycythemia vera? And there are a number of reasons that the MPNs may shift and merge. And this, at least in my experience, is something that's very really disconcerting to patients when after a couple of years of follow-up, you suddenly tell them the name of your disease has changed. This may be because of the development of new mutations that weren't present when they were diagnosed initially. There may be inhibitory mutations, so sometimes patients with myelofibrosis um, will develop new mutations that will allow hematopoiesis to increase, so they'll develop uh, thrombocytosis, or they'll develop uh, uh, polycythemia uh, during the course of myelofibrosis. We've spoken a little bit about the allele burden, and that's an important uh, feature as well. As the allele burden increases, there'll be an increased tendency to erythrocytosis, so patients may start to look like polycythemia vera. Um, the duration, which relates to the allele burden, is also important. Germline mutations or polymorphisms, changes in the structure of germline uh, DNA may be important inter an important interaction. Environmental pressures, we mentioned iron deficiency. So people who have iron deficiency and then it's treated will suddenly have unmasking of their polycythemia vera. And again, definitions change, so sometimes we're to blame for that. And there's a, quite an in important literature um, around suggesting that these definitions should not be the final word. Um, and in fact, we are misleading our patients some of the time by giving them certain labels in terms of the three uh, MPNs that we've discussed now, and we should perhaps look for different names and different terms to uh, describe our patients with. Briefly, to look at secondary malignancies. So there are established associations between the MPNs and secondary malignancies, and this relates particularly to skin cancers that are not of the particularly malignant metastatic version, in other words, non-melanoma skin cancer. And the technical names for these skin cancers are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. These are locally invasive skin cancers and need to be treated. Basal cell carcinoma can be very destructive locally, and squamous cell carcinoma, if not properly treated in its early stages, can in fact metastasize and can be a cause of death. So we know that there's an association between myeloproliferative neoplasms and an increased risk of developing these skin cancers. It's related to the disease, and it's also related to the use of hydroxyurea statistically. So it's very important to counsel patients um, early on, especially when they're starting treatment with hydroxyurea, about the need for routine dermatological uh, follow-up and to report early any abnormalities that they may have on the skin. But there's emerging data um, that we have as well. Um, and this relates, again, to the non-melanoma skin cancers. And it turns out that ruxolitinib uh, is involved in this to, to a certain extent. We're not sure about the mechanistic relationship, but certainly patients with ruxolitin on ruxolitinib have an increased incidence um, of developing these non-melanoma skin cancers. And it seems to be particularly important if the patient comes into ruxolitinib with a previous history of skin cancer. These patients need to be counseled and to be followed very carefully. Of equal concern is... Uh, solid tumors. So there are a number of uh, population studies at the moment showing that there's an increased risk of solid tumors, lung cancer, colon cancer, lymphoma, developing in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. This can reach as high as 15% in patients that are followed for uh, more than 10 years, um, and an increase of up to three times the um, background incidence of lymphoma in patients with MPN. And recently, uh, reports of very aggressive forms of lymphoma developing in patients with ruxolitinib a very, very high incidence of almost 6% compared to about half a percent in a control group, which I think is giving people um, who use ruxolitinib, both who prescribe it and who take it, uh, cause for, for pause and to uh, consider this uh, when taking this drug and, again, being involved in monitoring. I think there are less than 100 people in the room, so the American Society of Hematology allows us to show um, this uh, to small groups of 
of people. Uh, this will be presented in one form or another uh, in the uh, ASH meeting, which will be in a couple of months' time. A uh, number of colleagues throughout Europe, um, led by Professor Barbui, collected a large number of patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms, 427, um, who developed a second cancer and matched them very, very carefully with myeloproliferative patients who did not develop a second cancer. And there were some interesting outcomes uh, from the study that are presented in, in, the, in the abstract that's been submitted to the ASH meeting. And that is the patients with polycythemia vera were at higher risk for secondary cancer than ET. Perhaps intuitively, the longer the disease was present, the MPN was, was present, the higher the risk for developing the second cancer. Um, very nice, aspirin reduces the risk of these solid organ tumors. So patients receiving aspirin have an added benefit that we can tell them about now, not only clotting, but also cancer. Um, and hydroxyurea that we knew has now been formally proven to be related to uh, not only non skin cancers, the non-melanoma skin cancers, but also solid organ uh, tumors. So we have to be very careful uh, when we use drugs at any time, and now we have something to be even more careful about. And I'd just like to finish with the last couple of slides uh, looking at the story of iron physiology. Um, it, it's, it's very important. I think we've known for decades that iron deficiency is very common in polycythemia vera. It's common at diagnosis. It's common during treatment. And that is because patients with polycythemia actually have an increased risk uh, for gastrointestinal blood loss, there's an increased incidence of peptic ulcer disease in patients with, uh, with um, uh, polycythemia vera, for example. I was taught that there's sludging of blood flow, that means very treacly, thick, kind of uh, you know, hyperviscous blood, it doesn't allow proper um, nutrition of the mucosal cells of the lining of the bowel, so there's sloughing of the lining of the bowel, which causes um, very tiny pinprick-sized um, bleeds from the bowel. We obviously cause blood loss in our patients when we do phlebotomy. That's the whole point of doing phlebotomy. We're trying to create iron deficiency so that erythropoiesis will be slowed down. And even before we start doing that, this increased erythropoiesis, this tremendous jack stat signaling, um, causes this overproduction of red cells, and the red cells are using up iron. So there are a number of causes of iron deficiency in patients with polycythemia vera. And this is very important, and it's only recently been recognized to what extent it's important, because patients with polycythemia vera not only are symptomatic because of the cytokine abnormalities, uh, et cetera, that are present in polycythemia vera, but also because of iron deficiency that they have. And the symptoms of iron deficiency are very, very important in the context of MPN and in the general context as well. Patients with iron deficiency, even without anemia, and of course we're talking about patients with polycythemia who do not have anemia, but iron deficiency in itself causes fatigue, it causes muscular weakness, it can cause concentration problems, uh, memory problems, uh, GI disturbances such as altered taste, um, the, the desire to eat abnormal substances or unusual substances like sucking on ice uh, and grinding on sand, something called pica. Um, and it's very unpleasant for patients and uh, they very often are undiagnosed and are not sure why they're feeling so poorly. So it's very important to recognize. Management is another story because it's very difficult to give iron to patients with polycythemia vera because it can cause a very rapid increase in hematocrit, which can be dangerous and obviously counterproductive if what you're doing is phlebotomy to try and decrease hemoglobin. So the, the iron absorption story is abnormal in polycythemia vera, and I'll just try and show you this very briefly using this uh, set of cartoons over here, and then we'll come to an end. So this is a cell in the gut this is the lumen or the uh, hollow part of the bowel. This is where our food is. This is where our iron is. Iron is absorbed into the cell, and then it's secreted into the blood. So this is the bottom part of the cell over here is what will enter from the, the bloodstream, from the gut, the lumen of the gut, through a cell into the blood over here. And the little brown circles over here are iron molecules. And we have over here this channel called ferroportin, which is a very important channel to extrude iron from the cell into the bloodstream, which is where we need the iron to be, because from there it's going to be taken to all the organs of the body, the brain, the muscles, the bone marrow, etc. If the iron is trapped in this cell over here, it's useless. It's not doing anything. So we have this channel that allows the iron to come out, the ferroportin, but over here we have the little Puckman uh, feature, which is hepcidin, and hepcidin destroys ferroportin. So the more hepcidin we have, 
the less iron we'll have coming out. So we don't like hepcidin. Hepcidin traps iron in the wrong cells. In iron deficiency, what we have is relatively increased absorption of iron. We have as much iron as we can will be absorbed. We'll make new channels to absorb as much iron as possible. And hepcidin will be reduced. The little black figures over here are hepcidin. So here's normal amount of hepcidin. We have decreased amount of hepcidin to allow ferroportin to transport as much iron as possible. It's a feedback mechanism. So that's what happens normally when we have iron deficiency, say caused by uh, heavy periods or caused by a bowel cancer. However, in polycythemia vera, where we have iron deficiency, we do not have this normal compensatory mechanism. We're left with a small amount of iron being absorbed, and this has got to do with the inflammation that we spoke about before. At least that's what we think. Because if we have a look at the way hepcidin is regulated, hepcidin is regulated by um, expanded erythropoiesis, and it's regulated by inflammation. And we have both of these occurring over here in polycythemia vera. So we might actually be equal, equalizing it or equaling it out. Uh, we're only getting to learn now about the importance of hepcidin in polycythemia vera. And it does have certain importance, and it's, it's nice uh, to think about this because it's already been done in mice and it might work in humans as well. And that is, if we could build little molecules that did what hepcidin does or block erythropherone, if you remember, erythropherone is what blocks hepcidin. So if we can increase the activity of hepcidin, then what we can actually do is we can restrict the amount of iron that leaves those cells, the gut cells, for example. That'll decrease the amount of erythropoiesis that we have, and that could actually be a kind of a chemical phlebotomy. So this might be a way of restricting the amount of iron that gets into the bone marrow without restricting the amount of iron that gets into the rest of the cells of the body. So it's a potential disconnect between iron deficiency as far as the brain and muscles are concerned and iron deficiency as far as the bone marrow is concerned because that's really where we want iron to be deficient in those newly generated red cells from the bone marrow. Um, there's work in progress to try and develop this and hopefully in future years we can discuss this more. Thank you very much for your attention.